So <laughs> it's eight o'clock. Should we get started? Wonderful. I am so happy to be gathered here with a growing number of people and especially uh, the people who have volunteered to be part of this. Welcome to the inaugural meeting of the Quarantine Book Club hosted by the Jewish Women's Archive and Jewish Live. I'm Judith Rosenbaum. I'm the CEO of JWA. And it is great to be here with such a robust online community of people around the world and with our two authors, Rachel Kadish and Tova Mervis. JWA, for those of you who are not yet familiar with our work, we are a digital archive that documents Jewish women's stories and elevates their voices. We work to inspire all people to see themselves as agents of change. And we explore the past as a framework for understanding the issues that matter today. And there's a lot of issues that we need to be delving into. So I hope that you will check out our very rich resources at jwa.org. Lex, do you wanna say a few words? I would Jewish love life? to, yes. Um, so. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Lex Rothberg. I'm from Jewish Live, which is not the same kind of storied, incredible organization of JWA. Um, it is a much newer organization. It is about one week old, Jewish Live. Um, calling it an organization is also funny because we're more of a project at this point, but we're, uh, um, we're very excited by what has been achieved so far. So we launched about a week ago in the midst of this moment of social distancing. Um, we launched a Facebook group. That's really what this initially was, um, Jewish Live, the Facebook group. We encourage everybody listening to join if you're not in it already. Um, and this is a digital space where we're doing our very best to spotlight some of the best events, some of the most exciting events happening all around the world, not just the country, all around the world, Jewishly right now, that are all digital. Um, and so it's been really exciting just in seven days to see the variety of events that have been housed digitally. Um, things you'd expect, like Shabbat services, um, Torah studies, um, beautiful Shabbat services, beautiful Torah studies, by the way, but also things you wouldn't necessarily expect, people doing incredible creative artistic work digitally with one another. Um, there was a tour this morning of Berlin, Germany, a historical tour of Berlin, Germany that a number of people followed. It's been very exciting. But so we hope that you'll continue along with that and we're migrating um, we're not leaving the Facebook group, but we are migrating additionally to the Facebook group to a website, jewishlive.org, that's launching tomorrow that will that will house, um, hopefully, eventually, sort of 24-7 Jewish content that's being streamed live. So that's the that's the goal right now. And it's amazing to to share this quarantine book club with JWA as part of part of these efforts to build a Jewish ecosystem online. Yeah. Wonderful. Back to you, thank, Judith. thank you, Lex. Uh, so how's everyone feeling tonight? We have 367 people with 69 now, 369. Um, it's been quite a week. So before we start, I invite you to just take a deep breath, raise your glass if you have one. I've got mine right here. It's seltzer or maybe it's gin, you'll never know. Um, L'chaim, uh, I am deeply sorry that a quarantine book club is necessary, but I am really glad that we could provide an opportunity for connection and for meaningful conversation at this challenging time. So thank you for joining us tonight. Lex, do you want me to hide you now? Sure, that'd be great. Okay, hold on one second. Uh, and then... Um, so I'm really kind of in awe of all the people who are showing up here where there's still people pouring in. Um, while it is wonderful to have so many people with us, it also makes personal introductions and live video and audio impossible. So I invite you to introduce yourself in the chat box. Let us know your name and where you are. And I also will say that while we at JWA do a lot of virtual programming, this is at a larger scale and on a newer kind of platform for us. So please be patient and bear with us. Let us know if you're having any issues in the chat box and we will also be um, fielding questions there in a little bit. So here's the plan for this evening. Rachel and Tova will speak together for about 20 minutes and then we will welcome questions from you. If you'd like to ask a question, you can put it in the chat box. And then when we get to that part of our program, I will share questions with our authors and we will be able to have a conversation in that way. So 
let me begin by uh, introducing our speakers for tonight. Tova Mervis, who give a little wave, Tova, is that the on my screen at the bottom of the screen, uh, is the author of the memoir, The Book of Separation, which was a New York Times book review editor's choice and was excerpted in the New York Times Modern Love column. She's also written three novels, Visible City, The Outside World, and The Ladies Auxiliary, which was a national bestseller. Her essays have appeared in the Boston Globe Magazine, The Washington Post, Real Simple, and Psychology Today, and her fiction has been broadcast on national public radio. She lives in Newton, Massachusetts with her family and is working on a new novel. Rachel Kadish is her most recent novel, The Weight of Ink, was awarded a National Jewish Book Award, the Julia Ward Howe Fiction Prize, and the Association of Jewish Libraries Fiction Award. Her work has also been read on national public radio and has appeared in the New York Times, Slate, Paris Review, and the Pushcart Prize Anthology. She's been a fiction fellow of the National Endowments for the Arts and the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and she lives outside Boston and teaches at Lesley University's MFA program in creative writing. So welcome to both of you, uh, and welcome to the 400 people who are now with us. Um, so as the pretty overwhelming response to this quarantine book club suggests, people are turning to literature in these dark days and in this new reality that we find ourselves in and that we're trying to get used to. So I hope that we could start by talking a little bit about how you see the role of art in times of trouble. And what, what do you think literature can offer us now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, first, can I just say, just seeing all the names, I'm like almost distracted by looking at it because it's, it's, so, it's so nice just to see that there are so many people that there are just, that there still exist people in the world when you've been inside for so many days and just that sense of people coming together to be alone together in this way. Um, you know, I, I think that there's so many ways that we, you know, if your day looks like mine, I would say if I had to break down my day, um, five hours on Facebook, three hours cooking in the kitchen and doing stuff with kids, three hours reading the New York Times and these just reading and obsessing in this, in this awful place. And yet the only moments that I feel some sense that I'm both removed from the world around me and yet more deeply inside of it or when I'm actually able to read and write, when I can sort of push away everything else going on and just find this sense of, I'm gonna connect with, and to escape, but not only to escape. I mean, I think art is really a way of escaping the reality, but also it pushes us deeper inside the reality and to be able to straddle really both of those, those ways of being at the same time, of, of being deeper in and also being a way to remove ourselves from, just the sheer awfulness of what we have around us right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, um, I think these are the moments that remind us what the arts are for. I mean, we're in a number of, of different crises right now, and no one needs to hear me say that, you know, medical, economic, uh, all of this, we're, but we're also in a crisis of human isolation and disorientation. Um, human beings are meant to interact with each other. We touch each other. Um, we speak face to face. Uh, we read each other's faces. We, um, and when we're separate, it's easy to feel not human. It's easy to feel like start thinking of collections of symptoms instead of people. It's easy to feel small and scared and also suspicious of each other. Who was that person, you know, wearing the mask in the grocery store? Did, you know, did they cough? <laughs> you know, that, that kind of feeling. Um, and uh, when we, you know, when we can be together, we sort of remind each other of our humanity and sort of fortify each other. So we're in this crisis moment in, in terms of isolation, but I also remind myself, this is not a new problem for human beings. I mean, this specific thing we're in is unique, but um, people have, uh, there have been so many situations where people are um, unable to touch each other, to be together because of distance, circumstances, um, uh, time and um, people have developed a, a method of touching each other across those boundaries and that that's what the arts is. I feel sometimes like what the arts is, it's, it's human touch distilled into a form that can span those boundaries of time mm -hmm. and circumstance and uh, and you know when I, I I'm in the presence of you know I'm reading something, I'm listening to music, I feel more human, I feel the other person's humanity, you, you know, a good book does two things for us at the same time. It tells us 
that other people are just like us and we need to be reminded of, of that. And it tells us that other people have totally different lives from us, but, but they're still just as human as we are. And um, so I feel like this is a moment where we need, where, where the arts are part of the answer to this crisis that we're in. So who, what are some of the works of art that you're turning to in this moment for insight and connection and solace and escape? Um, God, where do you start? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have my favorites I go back to. Um, I read a lot of poetry in moments like this. I listen to a lot of music. Do you know, um, the Met has been live streaming opera this week for, for free for people. You, you know that so many people went to the Met website. Uh, they crashed the Met website. All the people in the world who wanted to listen to Carmen on Monday or Tuesday night, because that's what we needed. So um, yeah, but Tova, what about you? Well, it's funny, I found you know the one thing that my daughter, Liana, who you may have seen peer in at the corner of the screen a little while ago, the thing that we listened to today that really felt comforting was the soundtrack from the play, Come From Away. Mm. Play where it's there's the sort of quick synopsis is it takes it's a a, a it was a Broadway play maybe it's still on Broadway um, if there still is Broadway where a group of airplanes all land in Newfoundland right at right as 9/11 has just happened and the U.S. airspace is closed and it's sort of this disorientation as these planes land in this small town that people don't know why they're there and there are just these lines from it. Um, you know, this you, somewhere between your life and your work, the world may be falling apart and you feel like you're alone and you're so damn helpless. The next line of the thing is, and the only thing left to do is drink, but you know, not, <laughs> that part notwithstanding, um, that sense, I just felt like just that world between your life and your work, the world may be falling apart and they're all sealed inside this airplane and having no idea what lies just outside their own little sealed off cocoon that they find themselves in. And, and I think it's those moments, those moments of feeling like this has been felt before, this feeling, or I can take my own feeling that I have right now and understand that this is what people in all these other situations have felt, this, this sense of connection and using your own feelings. I also find that reading books away from the situation has helped. I think that you know, I spent a lot of the weekend reading the novel Writers and Lovers by Lily King. And it's a very sort of quiet novel about a woman who sort of coming of age in her late 20s, early 30s, and her mother has just died. And it's really a book about writing and about grief and the power of art. And it's, it's so removed from now. It's not a book that you would say is you know, relevant to the moment, but it's so, it was so much about just living inside this, this experience of this other character and entering her. The only moment the book became very scary was there was a line where she said that a friend of hers has this habit of touching his mustache. And I just shuddered and I was like, don't touch your face. Do not do that. <laughs> So those moments where you're taken out of the fictional spell and drawn, drawn back into our own world. But, but just that reminder again about people, I mean, it always comes back to that, to that sense of, can I connect to not just what's happening inside the cocoon of my own house right now, but in all of our own cocoons that are, there are you know, so many all around us that we're all experiencing so many of the same feelings right now. Yeah, it gives us a voice, uh, someone else's voice in our in our head with us, you know, it's sort of a way to be in conversation with someone who isn't in the room in a way that feels very intimate somehow on the page. Or I think about that also in terms of podcasts, why I love podcasts so much because it comes into your, into your head as if it's an intimate conversation in some way. Um, so when we were planning this evening and I was uh, encouraging you to think about a piece of your own writing that you might want to share, both of you were very much drawn to sharing actually the work of other people that have, that you've been drawn to or called to in recent days. Would either of you like to start by sharing what you selected as something that was speaking to you in this moment? Um, sure, I, Tova, I'm, do you want to start or should I? Well, yeah. <laughs> so um, I wanted to read, um, uh, I've, been, I've been reading a lot of poetry lately, but um, I went back to something I, I first read in college, which was um, The Fish by Elizabeth Bishop. Um, I hope my parents are listening because, uh, uh, you know, especially my dad taught me how to fish. So here we go. <laughs> the fish. I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat, half out of water with my hook fast in a corner of his mouth. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung a grunting weight, battered and venerable and homely. Here and there, his brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper. 
and its pattern of darker brown was like wallpaper, shapes like full-blown roses, stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice, and underneath two or three rags of green weed hung down, while his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills, fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers, the big bones and the little bones, the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails, and the pink swim bladder like a big peony. I looked into his eyes, which were far larger than mine, but shallower and yellowed, the irises backed and packed with tarnished tinfoil, seen through the lenses of old scratched Isenglass. They shifted a little, but not to return my stare. It was more like the tipping of an object toward the light. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw. And then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet, and weapon-like, hung five old pieces of fish line, or four, and a wire leader with the swivel still attached, with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. A green line frayed at the end where he broke it, two heavier lines, and a fine black thread still crimped from the strain and snap where it broke, and he got away. Like metals with their ribbons frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom trailed from his aching jaw. I stared and stared, and victory filled up the little rented boat from the pool of bilge where oil had spread a rainbow around the rusted engine to the baler rusted orange, the sun cracked thwarts, the oarlocks on their strings, the gunnels, until everything was rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. And I let the fish go. Hmm. I'm gonna read something that um, is a book that I probably read when I was in college and it's, I'll show it to you, it's vintage old school Jane Smiley from the age oh. of grief. And there's a phrase in it that I've thought of you know, just for all these many, many years. And I, you know, I didn't, I would sometimes go back and read the passage, but the phrase that always stuck in my head was from, it's from the title story, the age of grief. And it was that the, a man is watching the evening news and he says, I can't imagine that these people feel what I feel. And I think that's been important to me in the new novel I've started, that question of can we imagine that these stories we read about in the news, that they are human like all of us. And I pulled this down yesterday to, to look at it again because I kept playing with that, that um, phrase in my head. And the only thing you have to know about it, actually the, book, the short story was made into a movie called The Secret Lives of Dentists. If you need something to watch, <laughs> I vaguely remember it. I think I recommend it. But I'm going to just read you a paragraph. And this is, the only thing you need to know about it is the narrator is a man who's watching his marriage fall apart to a woman named Dana. I'm 35 years old, and it seems to me that I have arrived at the age of grief. Others arrive there sooner. Almost no one arrives much later. I don't think it is years themselves or the disintegration of the body. Most of our bodies are better taken care of and better looking than ever. What it is, what we know now, that in spite of ourselves, we have stopped to think about it. It is not only that we know that love ends, children are stolen, parents die. It is, not, it is not only that by this time, a lot of acquaintances and friends have died and all the others are getting ready to sooner or later. It is more that the barriers between the circumstances of oneself and of the rest of the world have broken down after all after all that schooling, all that care. Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But when you're 33 or 35, the cup must come around, cannot pass from you. And it is the same cup of pain that every mortal drinks from. My eyes filled during the nightly news. Obviously we were grieving for ourselves, but we were also thinking that if they were feeling what we were feeling, how could they stand it? We were grieving for them too. I understand that later you come to an age of hope or at least resignation. I suspect it takes a long time to get there. Thank you both. We've had some requests for each of you to share the title of what you read again. 
So this is The Age of Grief by Jane Smiley. I'll bring it very close. Um, it was, I think it was her second book. She wrote A Thousand Acres, which was one of my all-time favorite novels. And, but it's a, a series of shorts, a novella and several short stories. And it's, uh, you know, it's just one of these books that, you know, I remember so little of the book, but that paragraph, I feel like is always etched in my, my writer's mind. I love that book. Uh, the poem I read is called The Fish, and it's by Elizabeth Bishop. And I don't actually, um, I actually just have a print out of it right now, so I don't have the collection it's originally in with me. Thank you both. It strikes me that they're, both of the pieces that you read are very much about encounter and also about survival, which I guess are two things that we are aching for in some, in some way, even if they're also stories of pain and um, injury in, in some ways. Uh, so we, we've talked about as we sit here with, you know, nearly 450 people all together online and uh, watching each other's faces on video, or some of us are watching our faces on video. Um, you know, so many of us have been really changing the way that we're working in these days and, uh, and working from home maybe for the first times. And one of the, as I was talking about this with a colleague recently, someone said, well, it, you know, it's changed for so many people how we work, except maybe for writers who were already working from home so much of the time. So um, I wonder if we could switch to speaking a little bit about your process of writing and sort of what, what, does, what does it look like for you to be part of this creative process and, and how has that maybe been impacted by uh, the events of recent weeks? Right, it's funny when people talk about social distancing or you know isolating. I the room you see me in is where, except for going to the gym and picking up children at school, is where I spend most of my hours. And so there's in some ways there's the you know the joke going around that for writers this is sort of like what we always do this hunkering down. And yet of course it's entirely different when you feel like you can't go anywhere else. But I, I guess writing is a place you can go. I, you know I do feel like the moments I can escape are when I can enter into the imagination and enter into a different world and. Mm -hmm. I always think about writing as it's always this act of hope, right? When you start, certainly when you start a new novel, there's the hope that you actually can write this book or that, that it has the, the sort of depth in it or, the, or the, your interest can go the long haul in it. There's the hope that there'll be readers on the other end of it. And it, it really feels like this sort of almost casting something forward to the future. And you know, I find myself thinking about that so much more right now. Every time I sit down to write you know, for those five minutes in between, um, you know, Googling hazmat suits on Amazon or checking my, you know, just that constant sense of emotional disruption. But for those moments when I can keep my mind inside the book, it feels like an act of hope, an act of saying, this is not how our lives will be forever. This is, this is the now, but there is something beyond this. And I feel like writing becomes this way of entering deeply into an alternate world. And for the writer and reader both, we get to enter into a different place, to a different consciousness and to a different to really ask a question and to ask it in different ways in different directions and you know for the time I can concentrate I do find that very soothing and I think for all of us that question of how do we focus how do we both acknowledge the moment we're in and yet find ways to stay engaged in the other things that are important to us and other things we care about and I always think of the idea of when my mind wanders which is constant is just bring it back bring it back you know write for 15 minutes and I, I keep having this line from that uh, children's book, Mike Mulligan and the Steam Shovel, where um, you know the the book says, you know, the, the new steam shovels can dig in a day what a hundred men can dig in a week. And I keep telling myself very gently, you know, the coronavirus version of Toba can write in a week what the regular Toba could write in a day. And I feel like that's fine. Just write, write what you can, and just to both be gentle with ourselves in this moment and also to try to find ways to, to hold on to those things that are about hope and about the belief that this is this is a moment, this is not the new reality. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there's that quiet, you know, line of thought in my head, well, you know, self-isolation is is kind of our jam, we write, <laughs> what we do, but, um, but of course it's totally different. It's totally different when, uh, when there's fear and it's totally different when, you know, frankly, they're, you know, kids who are normally at school during the day or at home and, and things like that. I mean, my normal writing day, I, I'm gonna show you who I spend my normal writing day with. He's right here. <laughs> his name is Henry. Um, his full name is Henry David Thoreau. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, so I'm used to very long, quiet days. Um, 
And, uh, you know, not that there aren't struggles for concentration. And I mean, Tova and I never, ever text each other on a normal day and say, <laughs> oh, God, I had trouble concentrating today, right? That never happens. Right? We're, we're good. We're disciplined. Oh. No. I mean, it's, it's a struggle no matter what. You have to pull yourself back in. But right now, um, I think, you know, the first few days, I just, I couldn't stay off the news. I couldn't. And, and then I began to realize that the writing really felt like a solace. It really does. Making something. And even when it's not writing, whether it's it's cooking, you know, whether it's um, just you know doing some some house project, making something feels really useful and soothing right now. And um, I think because for me, um, because I don't outline in advance, because writing for me is an act of improvisation, there really is that sense of sort of you get in it and and you're just alert to what's happening in the scene you're writing and um, and sort of figuring out where you are. And to me, that's sort of a fascinating process, and it is a very um, healthy place to go, I think. I also feel like those moments when we feel emotionally broken open in one way or another are actually very fruitful times to write from, those moments of rawness. I think there are moments when we have an increased feeling of the capacity to imagine our way into other people's lives. I mean, so much of writing and so much of fiction writing is really about taking something, a seed of something, a little kernel and imagining it into a larger story to really you know, what I'm working on right now is this, this need to understand a story. I took a real life story of something I read about in the newspaper and and I, I need to understand it. And then the only way to do it is in fiction. And I realize that I'm better able to do that when I feel that sense of rawness of being scraped away. And you know, I find myself thinking about family stories also in a different way. You know what? And there's always that link between our own moments and then the stories we've inherited. And, you know, one of the things that is so much on my mind is for a variety of logistical um, safety health reasons, my husband is going to be spending the duration of this in, in Florida where he works seeing high risk obstetrical patients. And that first it seemed like we'd be apart for a week. And now I feel like, is it six weeks, eight weeks? And how long is this going to be? And what immediately made me remember was stories I have about both my great grandmothers. And mom, I'm sorry if I get these, these actual facts a little wrong, but my my mother always used to tell me a story about my, I guess my great grandfather came over from Poland to Memphis ahead of his, the rest of his family. And they were apart for 10 years, I believe. Mom, write in if I'm getting it wrong. I think it was 10 years. And she always talks about how she used to see her grandmother crying into her sitter, into her prayer book. And I always thought, what was that like to be separated from for so long? And on the other side of the family, my father's side, a similar story about a about my great grandfather spending winters, summers, southern time in Arizona because he had asthma. And I always felt like, well, they lived a long time ago. So those things didn't bother them. They were somehow super human, magically able to, to withstand these things. And, and I, the point is not, I feel like certainly that is so much harder, those stories. You know, they didn't have FaceTime, they couldn't text all day back and forth. But but the point isn't for me to say, oh, I have it so much easier. I shouldn't feel this way. It's for me to use the way I feel right now to. To, to crack open a door to what that must have felt like for them, to use myself to be able to better imagine these women, these women who came before me, who before it was sort of unimaginable. And now I have that kernel that I could imagine a little bit more of it. And I, I think these moments are just filled with those things. That we can, I understand fear differently. I understand this, you know, and we just to, to use those as writers and artists in any way to take those moments and, and take them in and then we widen them, widen them and re redistribute them into whatever it is we're working on. And we, we know that, um, you know, we think about this a lot at JWA also because we're in the business of stories, both historical stories and then also in, in many different ways that we tell and explore the stories of Jewish women's lives. And in our story collecting work, one of the things that we have built it around is the data that knowing stories of the past and particularly of our families, but families writ large, even when they are upsetting stories builds resilience. That it, you don't only need to hear stories of success to learn how to um, be strong and to have faith that things will improve. That actually even hearing stories about crisis work to do that. Um, and I think it's also part of why we we don't limit ourselves only to the historical, but also to the imaginary, because there is such a such a close relationship between the things that we see around us and that we're steeped in, and the ways that our brains take them in different kinds of directions. Um, and 
and the ways that we can draw on those stories to inform our own lives. And so one question that I had and which has already been asked by someone here um, is for Rachel, which is that your last novel, The Weight of Ink, had actually a plague in it, right? In fact, the plague and stories of quarantine in it. So how how are you thinking about that now? Does that do you have a different perspective on it? Are you are you drawing strength from the time that you spent imagining uh, being quarantined during the plague? Uh, uh, yes, yes. I, I had a reader um, uh, message me over Twitter saying, oh, "I read your book. I'm really grateful. I don't have a, a cross painted on my door yet because that's what they did with the uh, the plague houses in London." Um, so I spent a lot of time reading about the plague. Um, and um, reading both, you know, original sources and then uh, histories, works of, of imagination, um, and um, I mean, yes, there are similarities um, for sure. Uh, the fear, the confusion, the false rumors that would go around, the uh, the rumors about what caused the plague. I mean, yeah, we have it on Facebook. They had it on people saying that it was because there was a comet in the sky over London that year. It was the miasma. It was, you know vinegar was going to cure the plague wearing a, they wore masks too right they, um, those beak like masks with stuffed with herbs you've probably seen images of them in historical films um and uh there are all kinds of stories of um you know people coming up with what they thought was going to be the solution and uh of course it wasn't the solution i think um their helplessness is uh comes home to me in a new way now and there's a scene in in the plague scenes in the way to think where um a young woman just can't stand the quarantine anymore. They're in one of these houses sort of shut in and she just sneaks out. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling, you know, how, how uh, cooped up, how easily people feel cooped up. Um, but then there's the other part of it that is very, um, you know, I remind myself of all that we have that they, they didn't have. Uh, we have so much more possibility to combat it, to understand what it was, whether it's, you know, okay, if we can get ourselves together to, uh, you know, make more ventilators, we know, we know some of what works, we know social distance works, and we can say there are people working on uh, treatments and people working on vaccine, and that's totally different. Um, so it's both um, sobering, and then I, I remind myself of the differences, and that's fortifying. Um. Tova, there's a question for you from another writer from the South who wants to know how being from the South has influenced your writing. It's funny, for so long, for so many years, I felt like I would always feel like I was from Memphis. My family, I'm a sixth generation Memphian. And it always felt like this sense of place, that the feeling that you were from a certain place and you would always be from this place. And for me, I think really that was what made me want to be a writer in the first place. You know, from the very, very beginning, I started wanting to write fiction when I was in college. And that urge to write fiction wasn't even separate from the urge to write about Memphis. It was always going to be about this sense of place. And you know, it's interesting, I mentioned Jane Smiley before because her opening prologue for Thousand Acres really evokes this sense of this land, this Iowa farmland where they are from and this feels with this sense of connection. And when I read that, I feel like, oh, this is, this is my version is mental. The sense of this place defines home for me. I'll always feel this sense of rootedness there. You know, it's my over the years that sense has faded. I still always feel that it influences me. And you know, for years I've had this urge to write a sort of several generation Southern Jewish novel. I feel like there is a book waiting to be written, sort of a really, really answering the question of that people would always ask me, you know, why are there Jews in Memphis or how did Jews get there? That really traces these generations. And I wanted to center on this question of what does it mean to be at home, to feel this is not just where you happen to live, but where you must live in a place that defines you. And yet every time I start a new book or each time or each of the few times I've started a new novel, I, I always think, oh, it's time to, it's time for that book. And then something bumps it out of the way. And it happened again recently. I had a moment about a year ago where I was giving a talk and I said, you know, I mentioned that I wanted to write this story about my great grandparents in, in Memphis. And she said, well, why isn't it the time now? And I was like, maybe it is, maybe it is the time now. And then I got on this other tangent and other direction and it's, it wasn't the time for that story yet, but I feel like I'm not sure when I will write that book, but that that story I feel like is waiting inside me still. Can 
either of you say more about sort of how you know what the right time is for a particular story, how the story, I mean, I know, Toby, you just talked about sort of having that sense. And Rachel, you were referring before to not outlining and just sort of having this improv sense of writing. So how do you meet your characters? How do you find them and develop them? How do you find the story that you want to tell? Um, I, I can say that I usually, I start just, I don't know, kind of feeling obsessed with some subject or some subject, subject is kind of bugging you. And, uh, and that's really, it's sort of, you know, I'm, when you're working on it, it's kind of your obsession and then you publish a book and they call it your theme, right? But mm -hmm. that's, that's really what it is. And um, E.L. Doctorow had uh, talked about, he said writing a novel is like, um, uh, we, it's like driving a car at night from point A to point B and you can't see where you're going, you can't see point B, but you just see that little patch of, of road that your headlights light up at every step of the way. And for me, it feels a little more like a, I have a flashlight and its beam is like one sentence long. <laughs> and I'm looking around to see what's this terrain I am because I have a sense of it, but um, then it goes somewhere else and it goes somewhere else and I gotta go around this and oh, there's a mountain there. And it's, um, that part is fun. And and for me, it's um, it's, I mean, it's it is joyous. Um, I mean, it's serious work and all that, but it's, but it's joyous. There's a um, there's a kind of play in there. And um, for me, I think the not outlining thing um, is um, uh, if there's anyone watching who's ever been a student of mine, you're, you're <laughs> this is how my, here I am up on my my soapbox because this is how I always talk about it. But um, I really feel strongly for me when I write plot, it comes out of um, it's like a, a, the result of an equation. It's characters, right? People plus pressure equals plot. So I don't decide on the plot in advance. What I'm thinking is, who are my people? Who are these people I wanted to write about? And uh, what kinds of pressures are they under? And then you think, what, what would those people do under those specific pressures? And that's the plot because it's different for each of us. So, um, you know, you, I'm seeing there are 410 of us on this chat. So if you put 410 people under the same pressure, we're gonna react in 410 different ways. And so, you know, I'm just following what would these people do? And, um, and so I'm kind of on, on the edge of my seat seeing what the plot is gonna be. Um, and uh, which makes for a very, very messy first drafting process. Um, but it also means I'm always interested because I never know where I'm going next. Mm. Actually, I started writing a different novel. I had this idea and I was sort of interested in it and I kind of started piecing together this whole thing and it's going okay. But the thing that did concern me was whenever I had a chunk of writing, like four hours, I first felt this dread of like, oh no, four hours till I pick up my daughter from school. What am I, how am I possibly going to fill four hours? And just didn't really want to sit down to write it. And I kept saying, well, just give it a little time, give, give it a few more weeks and see what happens. And I just didn't really want to write. And which usually I feel like I'm sort of scraping time, you know, the 15 minutes in the parking lot before I pick up from school or an hour, I feel like I can use, I can use that hour. And then there was this story, there was a news story. I'm not going to say what it is yet, not ready to say it publicly what it was, but there was a story that was in the news about eight or nine years ago. And I read about it at a moment for me that it had a, it had a personal connection. Um, I knew someone who knew someone involved in the story, and it was a story I sort of followed. You know, would Google it every once in a while, and it was just kind of fascinating. It was about a family that does something unimaginable, and I just I you know I could find so much information online. It was really amazing, really, what you could find online. I could just find pictures of the family, I could find news pieces, I could just sort of piece together all of this information. We have access to an incredible amount of information. It's really, I mean, it's shocking in some ways what we can pull up if you spend enough time Googling. But what I became very aware of was I couldn't find the thing that I needed to know. I needed to understand how, how could they, how could they do this? How could this have happened? And I felt like I could Google everything, but I could never find, I could never get access to their souls to know this true thing about them, to, to understand it. And I felt that fiction was the only way to do it, to imagine it, to imagine my way into a family. And it really started with this, it really felt like this frustration almost that I was not going to get the answer to what I wanted to know unless I wrote it myself. And no one was going to tell me this thing, no matter what I read, that I didn't want the facts. I wanted that um, in, internal life, that emotional world of people. It always has to come back to people. And I, what I came to realize was the first book I started to write, I was interested in it. 
but I feel like you have to have that, like, you know, that rough part when you strike a match, it has to have that bumpy rough part and has to strike that match against you. And this book strikes that match. It hits me in the places that are complicated and raw and painful. And that, that, that this burning urge that I have to know it, I have to know the answer to this question. And so I start with that and it's a messy process. It's somewhat of a temperamental process. I'm just going to go on a little tour. We're going to go out, we're going to move like this. And you can see in the background, you can see my little, this is very recent. This was put up just this past week in a moment of slight temper tantrum about not being able to structure the book or to see it. And, and this need to, to sort of map it out. And so I make outlines like this. These are, you can't see them that closely. We were joking before that we can't stand up because then you would see that we're all wearing pajamas on the bottom. So I'm <laughs> walking you closer to my wall. But, um, but this, this sense of trying to piece together a story, trying to understand, you know, how do you tell this story? And what are the pieces? And it's just, it's a messy process. It's usually filled with so much uncertainty and so many questions of where am I going with this? But I feel like the burning, that, that fire is there and that is what I need to keep going with it. So there's a question early on that I think is from someone named Ronnie. And I think this is sort of the, the second part of that question, which is then how do you let go of the story or of the characters, right? You've spent years with these people. I know for me as a reader, I feel as, when I've really loved a book and I, you know, have usually only spent hours with a book. I feel a sense of like deep loss and mourning when I finish the book and feel like, well, I don't get to be with these characters anymore. Um, so how do you do it after years of, of creating characters and spending so much time in their heads? How do you let go? Uh, do you want to start on that one or should sure. I? Well, it's funny. I certainly with, with my novels, I had that feeling that the feeling of when you are writing a novel, you, they are your friends. I mean, they are your imaginary friends. They are people you think about all the time. And it's, you know, I feel like, oh, that character would wear that dress that I see someone wearing. You know, the sense that you're almost accumulating them along the way. And they, they live deeply inside of you. And, and then when they, when you finish, you know, it could be three years, it could be 10 years. I mean, I know Rachel and I both have had 10 year books. You get to live with them for so long. There's almost not that fear they're going to go away. You almost worry that they will never go anywhere. They'll never move out. And, and there is the loss. There's the feeling of these people are not people I think about at all. We were discussing whether we were going to read from any of our books. And so I flipped through my first novel, The Ladies Auxiliary, which came out 20 years ago. And I really had this feeling of like, huh, what is this book? What is this about? It's it's so removed. It feels so foreign. And I think now it's been a stranger experience because my last book was a memoir. And so the character in some ways is me that I have to let go of. You know, it's the story that is when I'm no longer writing is my own personal story. And even there too, there is that sense of distancing. It's, I feel like the door to the memoir is shut now. I'm not in that world of writing about my own life. And I think in order to have the, the new, um, the new experience, the, the feeling of being filled by new characters, you almost have to let go of the old ones. You have to make that space inside your head. I almost feel like even thinking about the other books or, or, or letting them enter my mind will, will crowd the new characters who are just opening themselves inside me and who are so fully present there that I feel, I feel that I know them so fully right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's hard to let go of them. And I think, um, <laughs> Fortunately, unfortunately, the process of finishing a book is so exhausting at the end. You're, you're always sort of dragging it over to the finish line with, you know, you, you do the um, the galleys and the line notes and the, oh, they found, you know, an error at the end. And, and um, uh, that it's, you're sort of, at least in my experience, it's so overwhelming toward the end that you're sort of like, here, take it. Um, but, um, but then there's a process of actually letting go of the characters and, um, it is hard. I miss them, but it's um, but it's also first of all when I when I give readings, uh, it, it's kind of a chance to visit with them again, and um, and then also they live in my head the way um, faraway friends do, uh, um, or uh, you know th that sense of something funny will happen, and I'll have in my head, yeah, I know what Helen would say about this. I know what Rivka would think of this person, you know, <laughs> something like that. So they there is that presence that doesn't go away. So we've had a couple of questions about, um, about 
truth and research and sort of how you think about that in the stories that you're writing. I think um, it comes up particularly, I think, Rachel, in your work, since like Weight of Ink required so much research because you're writing about a very particular historical moment that is far from our own. Do you want to? tackle that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, um, you know, we could make this a three hour discussion and I would just go on and on. I'll try not to do that. But um, I was, um, I was, a, I was very intense about the research because, um, you know, this is set, half of the book is set in the 17th century. It's back and forth. Um, I had to learn all this stuff about um, the Portuguese Inquisition refugees in Amsterdam and London, all these things I didn't know before and, and everything down to the details of what did a loaf of bread cost in 1666 and uh, what what did they wear and what did it, how heavy was that fabric and, and all of that. And I felt really strongly about getting the details right. Um, and I went to some ridiculous lengths and my kids just laughed at me. Some of the things, you know, I, I did to get lines translated from medieval Portuguese and, you know, um, but um, I had two reasons for, for being such a stickler about it. The first was just the usual one. Um, you don't want to get things wrong because look, how often have you been reading a book or watching a movie and it happens to be set in a place where you've lived or in a profession you've worked in and they get even one thing wrong. It's like, there goes the whole illusion of fiction. Why should you trust anything that writer tells you now? Because they got this thing wrong and because you know you're from that town and you know you can't see that view from that hilltop, right? So you wanna avoid unnecessarily losing readers uh, and there are the 17th century in London it happens to be a very well-known time period. And I knew if I got anything wrong, there were gonna be people who were gonna know and it, that was important to me. But I had another reason, um, which was this, I thought, I was writing a story about a 17th century woman who um, uh, struggles very hard to find a way to live a life of the mind that's otherwise forbidden to women in that time period and, and to write philosophy, right? And I thought all along, during all those years I was writing, when I finished this book, you know, if I ever finish this book, which is always, <laughs> there's always that little thought bubble, right? Um, people are gonna say to me, well, you know, Esther Velasquez, uh, my character, you know, that's a pretty story, but of course we know this didn't happen because we know who the six or seven women were who actually wrote philosophy in 17th century London. And they were all um, Christian, wealthy, aristocratic, childless with sort of, you know, one or two exceptions here or there uh, on one of those elements. They certainly were not poor Jewish, you know, from an Inquisition refugee community. So obviously this didn't happen. And what I wanted to be able to say was, well, look, this character is fictitious. But how do we know? Because if you have centuries over which women have been denied access to education and ability to, you know, if they had math in their heads or a symphony they wanted to write or whatever it was, it, it's very hard to do that if you don't get the education. But people are always trying to, you know, I think of it trying to do what the grass does, trying to grow up through the pavement. Most don't succeed because it's very hard, but some do. And for those who did, um, they had to pretty much write anonymously or under a man's name. Um, and we still are finding things that were written uh, or made by women that we weren't aware of. There's um, uh, Lauren uh, Belper in, and After the Fire wrote beautifully about um, Fanny Mendelssohn. We, we now know that some of the music we thought was by Felix Mendelssohn was by his sister Fanny, but it was published under Felix's name. So why would we think that because it's 2020 now, we have already clearly found everything ever done by a woman under a, a fake name. I mean, why would we think that? There obviously have to be others. So what I was trying to do in, in writing The Weight of Ink was just be a real stickler about the historical fact because I wanted to say, yeah, my character is fictitious, but here's how a woman could have done it. And we know that some tried and maybe some succeeded that we don't even know about yet. Right, there's such a, as from my perspective as a historian of women's lives, Sometimes we feel faced with just the enormity of what is lost, um, but there is also so much that is just hidden. And I love the way that the Weight of Ink really explores that. And one of the other themes that I think really comes out in the story of Esther Velasquez, but I think relates to writing more broadly, and I think to Tova's work as well, is the, the kind of compulsion to tell your story. One of the things that the Weight of Ink turns on is that even though Esther is doing something she's not supposed to be doing. She's leaving clues that she's doing it. She can't help but kind of put her story there. And someone asked a question in the chat also about the kinds of things that we leave behind, whether consciously or unconsciously. So I wonder um, if either of you would address that question about sort of what that compulsion to tell one story means, both in terms of yourselves as writers of fiction and writers in Tova's case of your own story, um, 
you know, where does that come from? What does it mean to us as, you know, do, what does it mean to you as a writer, as a person, as a Jew? Mm -hmm. I think we're always telling stories about our lives. We might do it informally. We might do it inside of our own heads. I think telling a story is how we make sense of our, our lives, our families, the world around us. And we, we tell different stories to ourselves. We might tell stories with a negative spin sometimes to ourselves or stories with a more hopeful end. And I, I think storytelling is just intrinsic to how we understand the world. We're always sort of putting events one next to each other with some sense of cause and effect between them. I, I think it's almost the most basic model of how we understand things around us. I felt so much when I was writing a memoir, you know, I, I struggled with the question of why I was writing my own story as, as memoir and not sort of disguising it and cooking it up as a novel. And I felt very much that question of, can we lay claim to our own story? Can we own the story that we live and can we write about it honestly and acknowledge all of the parts of it? I just say at some point, I, I noticed um, in the chat going by that someone asked a question about, about how we make sense of our stories now where they're, where they're fractured, you know, where someone, the, the comment mentioned for kids, let's say, who don't get to go to their, their college graduation, where our stories don't look the way we want them to. And, and that, I think, is the truth in so many parts of our lives where stories don't go the way we imagine them. I think we have this version in our heads of what our story is supposed to be or who we're supposed to be inside of our stories. And I think so much of the experience of of living our stories is coming up against the fact that it doesn't look like the way we imagined it would. It doesn't always look like the way we hope it will. And that that churning experience of the way where life churns through us and churns us out is that it it shapes us by those losses and, and by that sense of this is not what it was supposed to look like at all. I mean, this is not the way the year was supposed to be. This is not how I thought. And, and I think really owning it, owning those painful moments. And I certainly felt like in memoir writing, what, what I love about the form and what I loved about writing memoir was it was not a place to dress it all up and make it look nice. Memoir is really about breaking down those those facades that those versions of our, the stories we tell each other are sort of facade, the facade of how we wish it might be and breaking open to the way it really is and being willing to sit inside that experience, that painful raw experience of the way it actually is in the moment. And I think that is the real catharsis of storytelling of being able to be inside the painful moment and, and to stay there, to stay there for a moment and then a moment longer. And, and really being, being able to, to reckon with it. And so for all the things that we will miss out, for all the fears from the health and safety of the people we love, the safety of the world around us, and, and to the smaller things too, to the missed play that our daughter won't get to be in, or the high school graduation, the prom, and we can all just go on, list them, to not, to not push those away of, oh, well, those are small things, but no, those are painful moments for each of us. Those are things we sit inside the pain and feel the loss of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think for, for me, uh, writing, it's, it's breathing. It's, um, I, I love that uh, Henry James quote, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? Sometimes I feel off kilter. I feel like I don't know what I think. And then I have to start, you know, sentence by sentence, sort of one foot in front of the other. Um, and uh, I mean, I grew up with storytelling um, being, I mean, these are, you know, my, uh, my grandparents, my mother's parents who were Holocaust survivors, you know, my grandfather would say, here are these stories and you need to hold on to them and carry them um, and, and carry them forward. So to me, they've always been this sort of elemental, you know, thing that that are essential at the, the heart of the world is stories um but i think also just that that um i mean i remember you know being a teenager and you know feeling something so intensely and then you blast the music because because somehow you'll feel better if the world outside is as loud as the world inside you know that feeling of just you need to to balance things um so um yeah it's just for me it's necessary but i know some people it's that way for painting. It's that way for, you know, with other art forms. I think stories also, so, you know, so much that sense that we are not alone in something. One of the things that was really striking to me about writing a memoir was the number of people who emailed me. And, you know, with novels, you get emails kind of, you know, I would get some things over the years, but with a memoir, I got this outpouring of letters and it was, it was, it was sort of fascinating. It was so moving. It was my favorite part of writing a memoir. And I felt like inside each email and each connection was this 
urge on, on, on everyone's part, mine as well, to say we are not alone with this feeling. We are not alone with what we feel. And I think stories are what enable us to do that. And one of the things I've been thinking so much about this past week is that I want to use this time, this strange time, to be not less connected, but more, to find ways to connect. And one of my little goals for myself, besides you know, clean out the closet and things like that, are connect with people I miss, connect with friends that I haven't been in touch with, just write back the emails. That I usually think I'll write, I'll read it and think I'm gonna write back when I have you know, time to write back and then weeks and weeks go by, but to be connected, to be in touch with people. And I think it's both something we can do in stories and in writing, but also, also in, our, in our personal interactions that need for a more deeply connected world and that, that possibility of, of opening ourselves at this moment of we're all closed. I feel like I would bolt door, bolt shut my door if I could. You know, I feel like no one's going out that door right now. But but can I open myself? Can I open myself to the people around me even more and to really to be someone who returns the email and before I might not have out of busyness or to, to text the friend and say, I'm just thinking about you. How are you? And to really challenge myself to that every single day, even when you know there are times I would like to just stay under the covers, but to be to 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 do what stories do for us, that, that, that crafting open of ourselves in, in this moment as well. So maybe what we'll end with, there's so many more questions, we're not gonna get to every question, but what I wanna maybe leave people with is a taste of each of your writing. And hopefully that will encourage people who haven't read your books yet to uh, see this as an opening and invitation to jump into the stories that you've put out there. Um, as a way of connecting. Would you be willing to do that, to share a little piece? Um, sure, Tova, why don't you start? I'm gonna reach for my book over this away. I'm not standing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did bring them in my room or else I would have, we would have had to go on a little trip through the house to find them. Well, I'm gonna do something I have not done probably in 15 years. I'm gonna read from the Ladies Auxiliary which came out 20 years ago. And part of the reason I wanted to read from today is I realized that today is the pub date of the Ladies Auxiliary in Russian. Wow. <laughs> I had nothing else to say about that. Part. Happy anniversary. Happy birthday. It came out today in Russia. So we'll not be going on book tour in Russia. But so I'm just going to read to you the first two paragraphs of this novel that I started writing when I was 23. And it's, it's you know, I looked at it today for the first time in a very, very long time. You're going to read this in Russian, right? In Russian. You know, the yeah. only things I know in Russian are all the curse words because when a bunch of Russian Jews came to Memphis when I was in second grade, they taught us how to curse in Russian. So oh, okay. I'm going to do it in English. The best of cross-cultural exchange. <laughs> yes. Before Batsheva moved to Memphis, our community was the safest place on earth. Close, small, held together like a carefully crocheted sweater. Little changed in the city where we had always lived. And like our parents and grandparents before us, we couldn't imagine living anywhere else. We knew the city as well as we knew our own faces, could map each turn and bump in the roads the way we follow the curves of our chins. Memphis is built on a bluff, a high rising strip of land that overlooks the Mississippi River, shielding us from the tornadoes that sweep across Arkansas every year, just as spring is around the corner. When the warning sirens ring, winds hurl, and rain pounds against our thick roofs, we breathe easier up here on this God-given piece of land. When it is done with, when the skies lighten again to their usual peaceful blue and the trees stop their frantic swaying, we open our doors to see that once again, we have been passed over. Um, I'll read just the opening because it requires uh, so little intro um, of The Weight of Ink. So, ooh, Weight of Ink, um, <laughs> the reader's copy with all the tabs in it. <laughs> um, and, um, and all my edits where I'm still editing even after the book is finished, right? When, for the parts I read aloud. But um, when I, uh, one of the things that got me started writing the book was I had read um, Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. And there's a point where Wolf speculates on what if William Shakespeare had an equally talented talented sister, what would have been her fate? And Wolf says, um, she died young, alas, she never wrote a word, right? You know, that this would, a woman with that kind of talent in that time would never have written. And of course, 
that bothered me. And I was sort of, I thought, well, I wanted to read a novel that reached back in time to ask this question of what, what would it take for a woman um, with a capacious mind, a talent like that, not necessarily Shakespeare's literal sister, but a woman with something in her to, to express, you know, math, science, philosophy, art, not to die without expressing it. Um, and uh, I did a lot of reading and I fell in love with this uh, Jewish community of 17th century Amsterdam. I didn't know anything about the, um, the community there, but when I realized that they were Portuguese inquisition refugees and I started reading about them, they were so familiar to me because I grew up around Holocaust survivors, Holocaust refugees. And there was so much, there's my dog. There was so much um, that was familiar about the, the beautiful desire to rebuild, but the fear and uh, that it could all happen again. And, and um, so I fell in love with this community. I researched it. And because I don't outline, I just started writing. And so this is the first thing I wrote. I can't believe it, it made it all the way to publication because usually the first thing I wrote, I throw out. Um, but this is the opening of The Weight of Ink and this is Esther Velasquez. June 8th, 1691, 11th Sivan of the Hebrew year 5451, Richmond, Surrey. Let me begin afresh, perhaps this time to tell the truth. For in the biting hush of ink on paper, where truth ought raise its head and speak without fear, I have long lied. I have not to defend my actions, yet though my heart feels no remorse, my deeds would confess themselves to paper now as the least of tributes to him whom I once betrayed. In this silenced house, quill and ink do not resist the press of my hand, and paper does not flinch. Let these pages compass at last the truth though none read them. Thank you. Those are both great invitations to join us in contemplating a woman's life from a different perspective or a community in the case of Chova's book, a community of women and what their own experience is and what they leave for other people to, to learn about. So um, I wanna thank you for this wonderful discussion, for sharing about your own processes and what this time has been like for you and really for giving us an excuse to come together tonight and to find connection with one another um, and in literature. For all of you who are with us, thank you so much for being with us. This is the first in a series of virtual book club meetings. The next one is going to be on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time with Rachel Barenbaum, the author of Abend in the Stars. And that will be followed by a conversation with Esther Safran Four on Thursday, April 2nd, also at 8 p.m. Eastern about her new memoir, I Want You to Know We're Still Here. And I hope you will join us for those meetings as well. Uh, all of the authors that I just mentioned, those before us and those that are coming um, are now or have been in past years part of JWA's online book club. You can find our book, book picks for this year and other original book content uh, related to them at jwa.org slash book club and also some discussions on Goodreads. So please, I invite you to check it out. And while you're on our site, um, please sign up to receive updates on other information, other programs that JWA is doing. I know uh, that Lex would say you should also uh, check out Jewish Live, join the exciting things that they have going on. They're offering so many wonderful resources. You can follow them on Facebook. Um, thank you all. Good night. Be well. Take good care of yourselves. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Good night.